welcome to Rifles in the Ardennes. This is the World War II solitaire game by uh, Guitardos and Canny, and I apologize if I, I mispronounced that. And we're going to do a playthrough of a mission. And the missions, they can take a while. The first mission probably shouldn't take too long. It kind of really depends on how the board gets set up. And a lot of that is all determined randomly. And that's what gives this game great replayability, is the fact that every game is going to set up differently. So what we'll do is we're going to start by looking at the, the setup, and then we'll pop into the actual play. So what we'll do is, first of all, take a look at what are the steps to setting it up. And here is the sequence of play. You'll have your mission setup, squad selection, mission execution, and if you were playing a campaign, you would then have your end mission briefing, which is where you would track their progress towards experience points and developing new skills. We won't be doing a campaign, so we're just going to go ahead and stick with mission setup, squad selection, and the execution. The very next step is your mission setup. So you would pick your mission, and we'll take a look at the missions here in just a moment. You would then, after following your mission setup, you would place your marker on the game track, and you, you would then roll for terrain. And we'll take a look at those steps. Also, we'll jump right into doing the placing event markers, which is right after you do terrain. And finally, we'll talk about squad selection. Then we'll pop into the mission execution. So let's go ahead and take a look at the missions and find out what we're doing today. The game comes with a base eight missions that could make up your campaign. We're going to start with mission number one. This is what they recommend when you first start playing. It is, it is the easiest of them, but then easy is relative because the game is going to be modified by your event markers, possibly the terrain, and terrain does play a key part in this because it could either mean a lot of cover and protection for your enemy or possibly great protection for you, makes you a little more resilient. So every time we play, even this one mission, it can be a different experience. So this is what we'll go with, mission one. So our team has been ordered to patrol the area, gathering information about enemy forces. We're going to reach stripe one, that's our objective. It doesn't say anything other than just reach stripe one. So if I can get a group into stripe one, I'll call that a victory. We have ten turns, so I'll place the turn marker on the number ten spot on the game turn track. Then it says pick for the, the setup, pick your event eight markers, one through eight, place them in a, a bag and then pull and randomly stick them on your stripes. So there are six stripes on the map, eight markers. Again, when you play, that means there's a chance that your layout's going to be different because your event markers could possibly be different. So that's what we're going to play is mission one. And we've already looked and it says that after you have select your mission, you'll randomly roll your terrain, which is just right here we'll take a look at. And I'll place the terrain elements, and then we'll take a look at placing the random events. Now to do your terrain, you just look at the stripe that you're placing terrain for, and you roll a die 6, which I happen to have. And that's what we'll do right here. So I'm going to roll for stripe 1 is a 4. So again, right there, stripe 1, come to the 4 column. And it says, it's a woods. So I'm going to grab a woods from the counter tray. And because there's no red dot, that means this covers the entire stripe. I'll show you a red dot if we get that. That would mean it's a feature. So this woods covers the entire stripe. So you don't actually have to be adjacent to it to get in the cover bonus. So that could be good for me or gives the enemy protection. Let me roll a five. So again, stripe number two is also going to be woods. So this is like a forested area that we're going through. Now we move on to stripe number three. I roll a four, which puts a single tree. Well, that's interesting. So we're, as we go up, we'll look at the map layout here in a second, but this is already kind of telling a narrative. Now stripe number four is a one. So stripe number four is going to be open. And then stripe five, we roll a six, it's going to have a building. And I've got a building here. That was five. And then finally we roll for stripe number six, which is a two, which is open. So let's take a look at the map. 
Now the map that we play on is not a traditional map. It's actually laid out in what they call stripes. Stripe number one is the top of the map and that's where we're trying to go to. As you can see we've got the woods place so that entire stripe is woods. Then this second stripe is all woods and then this tree feature and we call it a feature because it has this red dot kind of indicating a singular item that means the stripe itself is open but if I needed to move a group into cover I would spin an action point and attach them to the tree to give them that plus one bonus on defense and as we look at the map four is open five had buildings and then six was open Six is the first stripe that we'll move on to when we start the mission. And uh, that means everything is off board when we talk about squad creation. And then as we move forward, we'll go to six and work our way towards one. Well, the next thing we got to do is determine the random events. Again, our special setup rules say we're going to use all eight markers. So I've got the eight markers here. And it says that when you want to you know, randomize something, use like an opaque cup. Or use one of those fancy felt bags you get for your you know beverage of choice so I'm gonna put those in here move the hand around a little bit and I'm gonna try not to look at the numbers but I'm just gonna place these in the stripes as we pull them out so stripe number one gets that event stripe number two gets this event I'm trying not to peek Okay, there's that event. One more event there for stripe number four. And stripe number five and six are off the camera, but I'm going to go ahead and grab those real quick as well. And then we'll take a quick peek at the map. All right. So now I have the random event markers are all set up. And that's the terrain that we'll be doing our patrol through. But who's going to do the patrol? So let's take a look at squad selection. Inside the book, when you're going to do your squad selection, it has a recommendation. It recommends that if you're going to play the Americans, that your opponent would be Germany. If you're going to play the Russians, then your opponent would also be Germany. However, if you play the Germans, then your opponents would be the Russians or the Americans. This is a great you know, idea because that follows historical setup. However, for those who like to tinker, you could certainly do any mission that you want whatsoever. That's the brilliant thing about the rules. They're not stuck to that. But I'm going to go more of a traditional route, and I'm going to say, I'm going to take a squad of German soldiers through a Russian outskirt of a forest, and we're going to take them into the woods and, and do a patrol that way. All right, so how do we build our squad? It's easy. First, you're going to have army points that you spend. And this says for Germany, you get 10 points. Every unit has a cost over here in AP. That's like army points, essentially. So if I wanted to buy this rifle unit, that would cost me 1 AP. If I wanted to buy an LMG, an MG34, it would be 3 APs, and so forth. You would just go down the list. So you could buy a mortar, Panzerfaust, Panzerschreck. You could get an assault rifle unit. But what I'm going to do for today's mission is use the recommended squad layout. So what that lets me do is simply have these three groups already created. That's what G1 is. So the first group would have a squad leader that has an SMG. There's a gunner with the MG34. And then it's going to have a rifleman with two grenades. The second group will have my assistant squad leader who also has an SMG and two riflemen. And finally, the third group will have two riflemen. That's the recommended layout. And it even tells you which ones carry grenades. So this basic squad layout not only gives you the soldiers, but also gives you some equipment. So how do we keep track of all that? Well, that's perfect question, because we have a unit roster. So I'll fill out the unit roster, and we'll take a look at what we have. At the top of the unit roster, there's a spot where you can keep track of your forces. Also on the unit roster, you can keep track of what enemies you've encountered. It also has the game turn, unit activation reminders, a reminder on what skills you can do or actions you take, a track for your recon points, combat modifiers, and then finally the game track. Since we talked about the game turns earlier, 
we know that this mission has 10 turns. So I'll go ahead and place that there and I'll try not to knock it off. But up here I recorded my squad, that base squad that I took. And I tried to name this the Beer Squad. Uh, you probably can't see my writing very well and it's sloppy anyway. But our squad leader is Sergeant Rock. You know, like Ice, Rock, Ice. And then we have the LMG, which is Private Hennessy. Well, I put PFC Hennessy. Then, then the rifle guy with that was Bush. Then in the second group, we had the assistant squad leader, which was Sergeant Weinhardt. He also has Private Corps with him and Private Weiser. And then finally, in my third group, is Private Ulang and Private Frost. So those are the folks that will go through the mission today. And, yeah, I'm pretty sure the Germans probably had different names, over-lieutenants and things like that. My German's not very good. So I'm going to go with the recognitions I know. You don't have to name your folks. I just thought that'd be fun. Give them a little personality. Well, now that we have a group and a squad and we have a map, let's go ahead and play the mission. First thing we do in our game turn is group creation. So before the game really started, we just got done doing our squad selection. And we did the groups based on the recommended. But when you play the game, the first step is, the first step is creating your groups. Like you can rearrange your groups as necessary. They haven't hit the map yet, so I can kind of decide how I want to do this. So here I have my leader, and I've just simply sat my mini here on top of the leader. And I've got the rifleman my assistant squad leader over here and then again we got um, oh I gave him an assault rifle he's supposed to just be a rifle he got flipped then here's the squad with my assistant leader the two riflemen and then finally that third group now over here we've got the LMG team this probably is not an accurate representation I think the LMG 34 should have just been like one rifleman but that wasn't nearly as dramatic as this here so I'm gonna I'm gonna go with this group mounted on a on a base for the machine gun team. What I'm actually gonna do, and what I have found that works pretty good for me, is I actually create two groups instead of three. The reason why I do that is because when I roll for activations, my dice rolls are really bad. And you have to roll activation points in order to activate and use your groups. So when you have a lot of groups, there's potentially groups I won't be able to activate because you roll three dice and we'll talk about activation but if you have just one squad then there's a chance that you might roll a lot of activation dice and it doesn't give you a lot of options because you just have one squad that you move a little bit it's not very flexible so so far I have found that making two fire teams works good so I'm actually gonna move this rifleman over here so now I've got my first group will have the, the actual squad leader, a machine gun team, and two guys to absorb damage. And then finally the second group, which will have the assistant leader and two riflemen as well. And that's, that's going to be our goal here. Move these two groups up. Alright, so let's take a look at what we do next. So on the game turn, we've done our group creation. Now we get to roll friendly units activation and here's those those points I was talking about how you activate your groups you actually roll three dice and this will be explained right here on the unit activation so I just take my three dice shake them up a bit roll them oh I got runaway dice wow this is the best roll I've ever had <laughs> on the first time I will take it. What does it mean? Well, to get an activation point to do something with a group, like move it or attack, you have to roll a 3, 4, 5, or 6. A 1 or 2 gives you no activation points. So right there is 2 activation points. Now a 6 gives you what's called a bonus action point. And that will allow you to activate like special... I don't maneuvers isn't the right word but it allows you to activate something special so for example if I move one stripe using my BAP my bonus action point I actually can also gain a recon point then recon points are tracked which are right down here and you can spin recon points to either re-roll a die six or add one to an attack roll 
or ignore terrain cover. It says here for vehicles. So that's actually a pretty cool thing to do. Uh, well, now I've got three action points. So usually what I do is I just kind of leave them here on my sheet and take them away as I spend them. Well, let's take a look at the map and figure out how we want to spend those points. We got to move somebody up onto stripe six, right? We only got 10 turns to go through the map. Now, when you have your troops off the map like this, this is the, the embarkation point, right? Or deep demarcation, whatever you call it. We're leaving from here. They can't attack from this area. They cannot be attacked. Currently, we've got nothing. So I want to move a group up. I want to protect my first group because that's got the squad leader and it's got the LMG. The squad leader is important because he gives a plus one die roll modifier to his group. So the machine gun would be a great team to keep him with because that would give that, you know, that's your big heavy hitter. Uh, I like to sometimes move my secondary group up to be a scout. And since I've got three activation points, this, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to move this first group up. That way they can unlock this encounter event, see what's going to happen to us, and then we'll see if we draw any enemies, and then I can bring my other group up as needed. So I'm going to go ahead and just start grabbing these guys. So I bring the assistant squad leader up. I bring this rifle up. And we'll bring him up. And we'll bring him up. So that's one of my activation points spent. As soon as you move on to a stripe that has a marker, we flip it, it's a 1. Alright, let's take a look and see what a 1 does. So to find out what the event markers do, you just go back to your mission patrol scenario card, and you look right up here, event table, and we can see that I drew a 1. Great! It says nothing. That's fantastic. So we've started our mission, and there's nothing to encounter on that first stripe. So I'm just going to actually take that marker off the map board, put it back in my counter tray. Fantastic. So that leaves me two more bonus or action points to think about how I want to use. So I moved that first group up with just a regular activation point. And what I'm going to do now is actually move this group up. I'm going to shift them over a little bit. So we'll move the squad leader up. And we're going to use the bonus action point. That way I can earn one of those recon points. And I'm going to track the recon point on my unit roster here. So I'm just going to move them up first. Put my LMG. I think I kind of remember that's the LMG. So I'm not going to worry about moving the counter with him. The other ones I kept the counter with the miniature just so I remember their name. So if they get shot... I can look back and make sure, you know, oh no, cores got shot. Who would shake cores? That's alcohol abuse. So there's our second action point. I'm going to put the recon point. I, I'm just grabbing a die and sticking it in the recon point section. So I, I keep track of how many recon points I have on a die six. So that leaves me with one more action point. At this point, since we're thinking strategy through, I can move another group up, which is probably exactly what I should do because I've got to get to stripe number six and nothing happened here. But now that I have both groups deployed to the combat zone, if I unlock enemies in stripe five or beyond, then I've got everybody in place that we can fight with. So that's what we're going to do. So finally, with my last action point, I move that group up and they're going to pull off the event marker. And they got a four. All right, let's find out what a four is. Okay, a three or a four says you roll on the patrol table on the army sheet. Well, that means we found something. Let's see what we stumbled upon. Since we're in Russia fighting, I just got to flip my, my German army sheet over. And the Russian sheet is right on the back. And then we have to go and look at the patrol table and what we do with that is we roll a die six and that tells us what we've encountered and it will even tell you what stripe it's going to be on so we roll I rolled a six that's great it actually is a rifle unit that has one grenade fantastic and a submachine gun unit which is not as fantastic the submachine gun units 
they only have a range of zero, which means they can only attack things in their same stripe, but they have a very strong attack bonus. And it doesn't tell me what stripe to put it on, so it's going to be in the stripe that I'm in. So we've stumbled upon some buildings, and boom, we found a rifleman and a submachine gun. All right, so let's take a look at the map and see what kind of trouble we're facing. All right, it tells us we found a Russian submachine gun, which would be this guy right here. He's got his little, I guess, a PPSH, and then a rifleman. So there we go. And this isn't isn't too bad. The reason why it's not entirely bad is because we've actually got all of our groups up to where they can engage. I can engage with this group, I can engage with this group here. And the nice thing is when the Russians came on they weren't deployed to the building so they don't have that plus two cover. Well at least yet they don't have plus two cover. There's a chance depending on how you play event markers might tell you to do like an advance to an empty terrain feature or you know there's different things that might actually drive the enemy to cover but they're not. That gives me a chance on my next turn through if I wanted. I can move a group to the building and then we could fight. But I don't have any more action points. It's now actually, yeah, because I spent them all. Yeah, because this was my third action point to move up. And that's what got them. All right, well, let's take a look at our sequence of events and find out what's next. The game turn tells me that we've done the group creation. So we create groups. We activated our friendly units and we moved them now we're going to check the enemy presence check when you check for enemies if you have one or zero enemies on the board you make a die roll and there's actually a chart that you would look at to see if there's an enemy present and it would tell you you know what to roll on the uh, patrol table that we just did however because we already have two enemies on the board we don't have to make that check we know they're there so that means we're gonna jump right into the enemy forces activation alright so that's what we're jumping into and that's actually here on your mission patrol the way this works is you roll a die six for the group so you activate as a group unless specifically over time something happened that these units came on one at a time then they would act individually but these two came on together so they're they're a group so I roll a die six to see what the group is going to do so I roll a two and it says if there's a target group in range attack nearest target group otherwise cover so they're going to attack and if they couldn't attack then they would just put themselves in a cover marker to give them some protection well, luckily, there is a close group. We'll look at the map here in a minute when we take a look at dice rolls, but essentially, we know they're attacking, so we would want to determine the target. Now, there is a die roll you could do to determine which group it wants to attack, and usually that's if you're not sure. Uh, the default AI pretty much is going to attack like the closest group, but if you have, say, two groups that are equal range to each other, then you might roll the die to see are you going for the larger group, the smaller group, and that's what we'll do. I'm going to roll, oh, of course, so I roll a six, and it says the group with the LMG or larger group. Uh, you know, but to be honest, because I have a group in the same stripe, I could roll, but honestly, they're going to go for the group in their same stripe because the SMG can't fire at range one, so he's in stripe five. Let's take a look at the map while I'm talking about it. Right, so here you have the Soviet, the Russian group, and you've got the German group. Well, I don't really need to roll the die. I could, and it said attack the group with like an SMG. Well, they all have SMGs. It's just that this is in the same stripe. The SMG has a range of zero, so I, I couldn't even attack this stripe with the SMG. This is the group they're going to go for. But what I can do on the die roll table is decide which unit it wants to attack. Or, even though I activate the group, each unit in the group will attack a different target. So what I'm going to do is roll a die 6 for my submachine gun unit. 
and the chart tells me I rolled a three so the chart tells me that the you're going to attack the unit with the lowest target number they all have a target number of six target number is like their defense and because it says lowest I'm gonna pick who he's attacking I don't want him attacking my assistant squad leader so when I roll for the attack of this SMG unit it'll just be against one of these scrubs now the rifleman I roll a five and it says on the unit attack table that it will attack the unit with the highest uh, CF combat factor. That would be the guy with the submachine gun. Uh, so the rifleman here is going to attack my assistant squad leader because he does have a higher combat factor. And then their submachine gun unit will attack one of my riflemen. Well, attacking is actually pretty simple. It's just a matter of rolling a die six adding in modifiers and then seeing if you beat the target number I was gonna grab the uh, army list I couldn't find it for a second so just for example here bring this under so like a rifle unit they have an attack factor their CF value riflemen have a one some machine gun units have a three the Russian light machine gun has a combat factor of one but it has a range of two uh, so that that's another thing is you may actually stay back one or two stripes to keep your machine gun unit safe and activate that group just to attack with the machine gun. That way you can attack like a couple stripes away. But over here then are your target numbers. So all the units that we're playing with today, even for the German team, they have target number of six to hit. So that's going to be easy math for us. Less stuff to have to remember. But we'll talk about some group strategies here in just a second when when we get to the next turn because um, I just had a thought but anyway let's do this attack so we know that a submachine gun has a combat factor of three and we know that an infantryman has a target number of six we're in the open there's no protection they haven't had a chance to move into the buildings so I'm gonna roll a die six I almost wish I had a little tiny dice tower I could put here. And we're going to see if we hit a 6. So 3, I rolled a 3, plus his 3, as a 6. So some machine gun units are very powerful in the same stripe. So that's going to put a shaken marker on the person. So when they get hit, they get a shaken marker. And that's, well, I said shaken, they get suppressed. If they get a second suppression, they're dead. Uh, so that was Rifleman C. So according to our unit roster, oh no, Private Yulang got shot. So I'm just going to put his suppression marker with him. Oh no. Now in terms of combat, a suppression marker gives you a minus one to your uh, dice roll modifier when fighting. So he is not as effective. I might as well turn them so they're facing the opponent. Now... The rifleman is attacking the assistant squad leader. So it's the same thing. Roll a die six. He rolled a three. Add his one combat factor. That's a four. Less than the target number. Assistant squad leader safe. And that is our enemy activation. Now the turns then just cycle around. I would advance my game turn marker. So it was on a ten. It's now on a nine. And you would start with the group creation. Alright, so I said, hey, let's talk about group creation for just a second. If they're in the same stripe, you can rearrange your groups however you want. And, and for part of me, I was just thinking, well, you know, if I kept my squad leader with like just the rifleman and the machine gun, like just one, then if I activate this group, I'm not losing firepower if I shoot at a distance, like two hexes or two stripes away. But what if I keep this group here, potentially then, that's a rifleman if I am tacking two stripes away. That can't do anything. And I think that's why they give your first group set up three people, simply because you could then have other groups to advance and keep your leader safe with the machine gun unit back. But you have a scrub rifleman with him to absorb hits to keep this stuff safe. Well, I just kind of had that thought. I don't know why that never really dawned on me before, but... Um, so really doing two groups, potentially I could be missing out on firepower if I attack two stripes away. Huh. All right. Well, anyway, I'm not going to change my groups. They're fine. So we're going to skip over that phase. 
Then we go back to unit activation. So I grab my three dice. One, two, three. Roll. I got a five, four, three. Uh, you know, I forgot that I had a recon point earlier. Said I could re-roll a dice six. I think that's more for me. Well, actually, it just says re-roll a dice six. So what I could have done was spent that recon point, re-rolled a dice six. So then you could have said narratively that the, even though the Russian unit shot, but because I was advanced knowledge of their presence through quote unquote recon, I was able to find some protection. So I could have possibly negated that suppression. But we'll leave it. I just got to remember I have a recon point floating around out there still. All right. So I've got three points. Mostly I want to, well, actually what I'm going to do, because this group is still in the same stripe, I'm going to spend one action point and move this group to the building. So all you got to do is move your units so that they are adjacent to, they're touching the building. Again, I'm imagining narrative as it plays out. So we move up, we uncover a couple guys that are, are walking around, they ambush us, they wound one of my troops, we pull back into a building that we find, and we're pinned down. So I got two actions left. Well, we want to fight. We're going to go ahead and activate this group with our next point. Boop, boop. And they're going to attack these guys out in the open. Now, combat's going to work exactly the same way. Now, riflemen have a combat factor of one, the submachine gun unit has a combat factor of three. Well, who am I attacking? I'm going to... It doesn't say that you have to declare all of it at once. So what I'm going to do is use my submachine gun guy to attack their submachine gun guy. And then I roll... Because since he's target number of, of six... Nice! I rolled a six plus my three. They're not in cover or anything like that. So he gets a suppression marker. All right, we're off to a good start. One more hit and he's down. What I can do though, I mean, if I wanted to, I could now say, since these all have the same combat factor of one, I'm just gonna roll three dice and then every six is a hit and then I'll just assign the, the damage. Oh, those are all misses. Since they only get one combat factor, I need a six. That would be five and five. All right, so all the riflemen missed. Well, that was sad. When you're activating your groups, the rules say that you can only, no matter how many action points you have, you only get to make one combat attack with a group. So I could like activate this group to move, move to cover, and, and do several movement actions, but only one attack. But I move them to cover, they've all attacked. I'm gonna be done with this group. So now my group that I have in stripe one, they're going to attack. And this will be a little bit different because they actually have the a squad leader. So they're going to get a plus one die roll modifier when attacking because I'm activating the group. I'm going to go and check the machine gun unit first. What did I say? My good, good memory tells me. I got to look at my chart here. It says the LMG team has a base combat factor of two. Nice. So we'll activate them. I'm going to roll them separately just again because they have a different combat factor value. And they get, uh, they roll a four. Well, this is nice. They roll a four, add two combat factor for being a machine gun unit, which is a six. That's a hit. Then I would have added plus one die roll modifier for the squadlers. So that would have been seven. So that they hit. I'm actually going to suppress the other riflemen. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to make it difficult for them in case they get another attack. I just want to make it difficult for them to fight. So they each have a suppression. The squad leader can't attack because he's got a submachine gun, range of zero. These guys can attack because they have a range of one. So they're going to add their plus one combat factor, plus one die roll modifier for the boss. I'm going to roll two dice because it's the same numbers. All right, so I rolled a four and a two. I'm gonna add two, again, combat factor plus one, plus one die roll modifier for the squad leader in their group. That's a six, that's a hit. 
and we'll go ahead and take this unit off. So one of the soldiers was aiming at their submachine gun unit. Awesome. Now, if I was keeping track of this on the unit roster, there's actually a spot where you keep track of the enemies that you encounter, and then you can write down their ID number. Since I'm just doing a, a singular mission, and I'm not going to worry about moving on to like a campaign, I'm actually not tracking that. I'm just taking my guys through and hopefully get them out the other side alive. But anyway, that's that's all my squad point activations. That's all three of my activation points because they moved to the building, fired, then they fired. That's the end of the turn again. So now, oh no, that's that's the end of this phase. So now what I got to do is the in, check for enemy presence. We're down to one enemy on the map. Now we got to check to see if there's any more. Now I mentioned that earlier, there's actually a chart that you roll on for enemy presence. So if you only have one or zero enemies on the map, we're going to see if there's any more that just happen to be floating around. So I'm going to roll the die. I roll a three. So luckily for us, our chart says one, two, five is nothing. No additional enemy units appear on the map. If I roll a six though, we're going to have company. So now that we've checked for enemy presence, we go back to the map and do enemy activations. Well, before I actually get to look at the map and do an attack with that Russian unit, I'm going to check on the enemy activation table and see if the AI has another idea. Well, I roll the two and it's back to a regular attack. So there's op options that it could do uh, the group. Like it says, if the group contained a suppressed unit, then they would rally otherwise attack. So you always want to make sure you check the enemy activation table first before you decide what the unit's going to do. Since I rolled a 2, even though he's suppressed, he's going to go ahead and attack. So let's take a look at the modifiers for that. In our previous turn, we saw that the Russian, or the Russian, the German group here actually had a chance to move into the building and then they were able to attack. Since he's attacking the closest group, I'm going to say it, it would still be this group because they're in the same stripe. Because technically one stripe away is, is one, so this stripe is not the closest group. So this puts him in a, a bit of a predicament because he can't really attack. Let's read all of number four. It says attack nearest group, otherwise cover. Well, the thing is they can't hit the Germans in this building right because he's suppressed that's a minus one die roll modifier they're in the building now that's an additional plus two cover that's gonna make their target number just alone an eight yes he gets a plus one normally but because he's suppressed you're gonna uh, subtract one from the die roll he can't attack so if they can't attack there's actually a rule in there that says they can put themselves in cover if there was like a, a couple of units, they could then fire, make, form a fire group, and you would get a bonus to hit, like you could add their, their combat factor. But he's all alone, and he realizes he can't do anything. So what he does, I'm going to have him dig into cover, make him a little tougher to pull out. That seems fair. Why waste a shot? Make himself a little tougher. Now, that's important because that could delay my advance. I got to get to stripe number one, and if I leave a lot of people behind me, that could cause trouble later on. Well, that's the end of enemy activation. We checked for enemy presence. We did the enemy activation. Now the turn would cycle through. We're now on turn eight. We would then take a look at our group creation. I'm going to keep my groups the way they are. Now we're going to move on to activations. So I roll my three dice. Oh my goodness that's bad so ones and twos no activation well okay so we're gonna skip my part we're scared <laughs> so we've brought my squad to a halt then we check for enemy presence I'm, I'm just gonna roll the table and tell you the result I rolled a three so there's no more enemies on the map great go to enemy activation I roll I rolled a two. Again, it would said if there's a target group in range. You know, to be fair, 
it does say if there's a target group in range attack well it says attack nearest target group otherwise cover this is still the nearest target group they're gonna stay hunkered down in cover to protect themselves all right that would bring us to the end of another turn so now we go to seven and my turns are shrinking away so I have to decide what I'm gonna do here based on this roll and again I roll a one two and a two that's fantastic <laughs> all right no activations for you all right well then we're going to roll on the enemy presence table I rolled a five yay no new enemies appear activation He's going to stay put. That's the end of another turn. So now I'm down to six. Six turns remaining to get my guys up to stripe number one. Oh, this isn't looking good. We're not going to change the groups. I roll for activation points. Okay, now for whatever reason, the squad leader is barking orders, getting them moving. I guess they were afraid of the unknown. They didn't know who was out there. I'm going to remove the two because that does nothing. Two activation points. What do I do? I've got to move. I can't do a recovery roll with this guy. I could with my bonus point. It will allow me to attempt a recovery roll to remove his suppression. Um, but there's going to be like a die roll penalty to that because he's not with the actual squad leader. If I was with the actual squad leader, we could use that activation point and do a recovery roll. No problem. But I might want to save that six for something else. I could because that gives me another uh, potentially a recon point if I spin that way. Um, I gotta move forward. That's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna move this group forward. I'm going to move them out of the building so they leave. They use the buildings as cover and they move into the next stripe. And because they moved, they get a recon point. So I'm gonna change my recon point tracker to two. And I'm going to remove that activation die because they're done with it. And I flip the marker. Let's see what a 5 is. Hopefully something good. Well, it's not good. 5 is an enemy LMG on a building in the previous stripe. Previous stripe is the lower number. So I'm on stripe 4 when I pull that. That means there's an, a Russian LMG unit on stripe number 3 already in a building. All right, well, let's set them on the board. I'm going to go ahead and take the five off of the event that they triggered. And look at the stripe. Now, the stripe had a tree feature. Because the Russian machine gun team deployed in buildings and there wasn't already a building on the stripe, I have to add a building to them. They still have a marker because we haven't advanced yet to uncover it. This is bad. This is bad semi-powerful unit in a building is going to be very hard to dig out of there and I still have my first group all the way back on stripe number six trying to deal with the Russian in front of them uh, should not have split the group but I thought at the time that would be great not so good well luckily I still have one activation point with the five so we're gonna go ahead and attack Let's just back up here and look at the other combat spot. So we're going to activate this group, and we're going to attack him. Well, we're going to attack with the machine gun unit first. So they get the two combat factor, add one for the Russian squad or German squad leader. Roll good. Ooh, finally. So I rolled a five. So the machine gun unit finally takes out this guy who is hiding. See his target number normally a six add one for the cover so it's target number of seven but because I had plus three I could have hit all the way up to target number eight all right so we've eliminated him Whew. that actually makes me feel pretty good I was getting kinda of worried about that so let's go ahead and put the cover back here that's all my action points and now I've cleared a path that I can bring up the rest of my squad to help assault the building so that means we move on to the enemy presence check 
when I had that other rifleman on there, I wasn't too worried. I, I didn't have to roll. And that was a wounded guy hiding in cover. Well, now I'm back down to one unit, enemy unit on the board. So I have to roll. And if I'm lucky, nobody else shows up. Because if I roll and it says check the patrol table, I could be adding like two troops that are fresh and ready to fight. I rolled a two. Yay. No new troops enter the board. Well, now I'm left with the enemy activation. So that's that machine gun unit. I'm going to check their activation table. I rolled, I could roll on camera, I suppose, but I rolled a 5 for the activation. And what it says for enemy activation on a 5, if there's a target group at range, 1, there is, it says advance, then attack. Otherwise, cover, then attack. So essentially, they want to move up and attack. If they couldn't, then they would find cover, then attack the target. Well, they're already in cover, and there is somebody at range one. So you follow, you follow the enemy AI. That probably tactically is not the best option, because where this machine gun unit is at, they're in cover really good. But for some reason, the AI says they want to come out. Okay, I'm actually okay with that. As far as activation rolls go, that worked out in our favor quite a bit. Now, on the other hand, part of an advanced move is when they move to the stripe, they would look for an unoccupied terrain. Uh, let me double check something real fast on that. All right, so it's not as bad. It, it says in the rules that if you advance and there's no feature, then they're going to move or they're going to put themselves under cover. It also says remove cover from uh, an enemy unit. There's no cover. So I think we're okay. So they moved towards us. Even though they moved out of their building, somehow they thought it would be best to position to where they could negate our cover and put themselves in cover. So that's still a, a one defense. I guess not terribly horrible. But there they are. They did an advance. And now they attack. All right, well, now we'll attack. They're going to attack this group because that's where they're at. They have a cover or a, a combat factor of two. Let's see. I'm going to roll and then take a look at the target table. Five. Five tells me they're going to attack a unit with the higher combat factor and that's going to be my submachine gun unit. Whoops, didn't mean to bump all that. Alright, so let's roll a dice. Oh good, I rolled a one. Plus two is three. That's lower than the target number of six of them out in the open. Enemy activation is done. We now advance our marker we have five turns remaining. I'm going to roll now to see how many action points I get from my squad. I remove the two because that's not used. Fours give me one. What I could do is I'm going to move this group up because I don't want to leave them too far behind. Now I could move them up one more but I need to attack. So that's another action point gone. I'm going to use an action point on this group to attack. So they're in cover, but we're going to come at them. The submachine gun, I'm going to roll for him separately because he has a different combat factor bonus. So uh, he has a combat factor of 3. Minus 1 for the cover is a 2. So he's going to hit their target number of 6 on a 4+. plus. I rolled a 1. Alright, so submachine gun didn't work. The rifles... They have a combat factor of one, uh, their cover of one, so basically they're going to hit on sixes. And no going. Now I do have two recon points. I think, I think we'll spin one. It says if you spend a recon point, you get plus one die roll modifier to an attack roll. So I'm going to add one here to this five, turn it into a six, which will suppress. So they're in cover, suppressed. And that's the end of the friendly forces. We then check for enemy presence. I rolled a four, so no new enemy units appear. Enemy activation, I roll on the activation table. We roll a four, and a four just simply states, if there's a target group in range, attack nearest target group, otherwise cover. Well, they're in cover, 
and there's a group in range that is not in cover. They have a combat factor. Well, their light machine gun, fortunately for us, the Russian machine gun is only a combat factor of one. So we're going to roll a die six and decide which unit they're attacking. I rolled a four, so it says unit with lowest target number. All right, so that means I can hit one of my scrub rifles. So here comes his attack roll. Three plus one is a four. Great everybody's safe so their machine gun unit from fire well they're suppressed so that would have been a minus one uh, didn't hit anything lucky us so that's enemy activation we're now down to turn four four turns left to get up I got to roll my activation dice yeah the game's picking up now we've explained most of the rules so we can kind of just move forward got to reduce my recon points by one there we go we got another bonus point awesome and three activations we need to get rid of this group I think we'll have this group attack because their submachine gun yeah is is a good strong option mm. either one the submachine gun or the machine gun have the same chance of dislodging them we're gonna go with this group here though um, yeah, we'll do that. When I look at my, if I just fire, ah, because I've got that bonus action point there, I'm actually going to go ahead and spend it now because, you know, that would convert to like a recon point if I move move forward, but I'm going to use it as an attack. So using a bonus point on an attack gives you a plus one die roll modifier. So we're going to check with the, the group. The submachine gun unit is a three combat factor, minus one for the cover plus one for the dice here that means he's got plus three on his attack roll alright come on you need a three or higher to take him out submachine gun does it alright so we'll go ahead and remove them we cleared the path awesome that was their attack there's nothing else to attack I then have two more action points I'm actually going to you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to move this group up because if I uncover enemies, I'll just move them into the building for protection before the enemy activation. So that's what we're going to do. Move them up. Flip it. Oh no, we got a six. I don't think that's good. Well, it's not the worst, but it tells me that we did find an enemy rifleman on a tree in the previous stripe which kind of makes sense because the next stripe up is woods all right let's put them on the map okay so we have a rifleman we'll put him in a kneeling position next to the tree okay so they did an attack they did a move and I still have one action point left well I did uncover yeah so we're going to move them to, they can't attack again, but we're going to go ahead and move them to the building. That way when the Russian unit activates, they have some protection. Now I got to be careful because I still have that first group all the way back on stripe five. And now I've got my one fire group moving up about to go into stripe two. So I got to be careful. All right. Now that my activation points are gone, I get to make a roll to see if there's more enemy presence. I roll a one. Great. No more enemy troops on the board. Now we go to enemy activation. So I'm going to roll for him. Oh, you can't see that where I'm rolling. But he rolled a one. It says enemy activation. If the activated group contains suppressed units, then rally. It doesn't. Otherwise, attack nearest target group. Well, they're going to attack. And they're attacking my group in the building. All right, let's go ahead and do some math on that. Well, I went back just to double check something, and I was wrong. If they are not able to shoot at a particular target number because they're like in a building, they don't put themselves in cover. It says they activate in advance order. So I think I, I got excited and, and messed that rule up previously. But thematically, I think it worked out. It made sense at the time. 
because here's the situation that I have. It says this unit is going to attack the nearest group. That's this group here. But they're in a building. So I got to look at the math and make sure that he does have a chance to hit. Uh, so he's got one combat factor. So he's going to add plus one to his roll. They're going to subtract two. So basically the building adds to their target number. That makes them an eight. Well, with his plus one, the best he could hope for is a seven. He can't hit them. Now, the rules say, though, that if you had multiple units in your group and they couldn't hit individually, then they would fire together. They would add their combat factors together and make a single attack. Well, he's all by himself. So unless my math is off, uh, he can't hit anybody in this building. So he's not going to go to cover. It says he's going to advance. Okay. Because then that eventually would allow him to check for other groups that he could possibly attack. So what he does is, since he's a lone rifleman, it's almost like a sniper. So he, he performs an advance. So he goes to this stripe and he moves to an unoccupied terrain feature. Eh, right there. Now, he is in cover and he's protected. And it says, you know, he performs the advance. And then he would do an attack. And now, this is interesting because it almost puts the AI into a loop. Because it says he's going to activate an attack. But we're back in the same situation. The nearest group he can't hit. So he would perform an advance. Boop. Now he's on stripe number four. I now have two groups. And it said he would attack the, the closest group. Well, if I've got two groups, I would have to decide which group he would go for. Logically speaking, he would attack the group that's out in the open. Oh my goodness. So now i got to come down here. So here we have a very interesting narrative, right? We moved up, uncovered a sniper in a tree. He's not really a sniper. It's a rifleman, but for my story, right? We find a sniper. The sniper realizes he has no target, so he moves, positions himself to another defended location. Still can't get a good shot, so he moves towards the group in the open. Well, he himself is in the open, but now he has a clear shot down here at this group. This is a good target. That's my machine gun, my leader, and a couple of riflemen. Wow. All right. So let's roll for the target. I'm going to see which unit. Oh, probably can't see that. So it says a one. It says unit with lower target number. Okay, good. See, this is why I kept a couple riflemen, just to absorb damage potentially. But see, he can attack this group because he's got a plus one. They are target number six, so on a five or a six, he hits. And he hits. All right, so he snuck himself around. And we're going to put a suppression on I. Let me look at my chart. Who's Rifleman I? Oh, no, he shot Private Bush. Private Bush was carrying a grenade. Look at that. Now, if I mess that sequence up, because I haven't really counted that before, I like that. That's cool. I just put the AI in a loop and it kind of fixed itself into a situation that made sense. Very cool. I'm going to run with that. I like that rule. Now we're done with that turn. Now I go and move my marker down to game turn three. Oh my, that's bad. I got to get to number one. It's like I got to race that group up there, it feels like. So. You take a look at your group reorganization. Not going to restructure my groups. I roll my three dice for activation points. I rolled a one. Take that out. I get a bonus action point and a regular activation. I got to make a dash. See, now I got to dash through the woods and try to get to location one. So we're going to move, we're going to push this group up. And and they reveal a marker. They reveal a marker eight. Something tells me that might not be good either. Let's take a look. All right, eight. It says enemy, a rifle on trees on previous stripe. 
Why does that sound familiar? So we're going to grab a rifleman. Oh no, I bent a rifle. And we're going to put him on a tree. All right, let's take a look at the map. So I'm going to take off the event. I'm going to put a rifleman. And I'm going to put, i got to find another tree. Well, imagine that. Trees in woods. I gotta flip all these markers and find a tree. All right, so he's found himself a tree in all the woods. Yeah. Now, what's nice is I'm looking at these stripes. These are the stripes that have cover for the whole stripe. At first, I was gonna move my my group here next to the tree to get that plus one, but I don't need to use an activation point for that. Because I now finally hit the area where the stripe is covered by woods. Now for my riflemen, these terrain features aren't cumulative. You pretty much select the best one. Uh, if I remember, I'd have to go back and look, but nobody has cover. I think cover adds one to that. Because that means you're like really dug in. But I'll double check that when I get there. So right now, nobody has to move. Uh, he's got plus one protection. They got plus one protection. And they have one action point. But I still have groups down here on two and four. Because if I need to, oops, well, you know, by golly, if I need to, all I had to do was hit reach stripe one. I, th I think we'll do that. I think if I just play this, because uh, I might say, yeah, I was going to move up so I could assault next turn. So I'm going to move them up. Oh my goodness. I think we just kind of won. I know. In a way, you could do that for this first mission. Just bypass everybody. Run by them. Because you know what? I didn't see anything in the rules that said you couldn't. Huh. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's see what we did encounter. A two. Well, luckily, we've encountered that before. One and two is nothing. So there was nothing extra here. And that would have been my action points. We would then check for enemy presence, which we don't have to because there's two enemies. I'll let them have their action so we can finish out the turn. Now, I'll take a look for the campaign rules because maybe maybe it would be important to start you know, tracking who, who you're fighting if you're doing a campaign. For me, this was just kind of a race up the track try and get to turn or uh, stripe number one before I ran out of turns. So let's take a look at our enemies. We'll start here since we have a rifleman. I'm going to roll the die to see what unit he's going to attack. He's going to attack a lower target number. So we have a lot of targets here. They're all in plus one cover. He has a plus one combat factor. So he's hitting on a six. Ooh lucky so he didn't hit anybody because they're they're in the woods because it covers the whole stripe so that's their plus one protection well I'm gonna come down here now so this rifleman is one stripe off so he's going to attack and he's gonna roll to see which unit again he rolled a one so he would attack the lowest target number which I would say is this unsuppressed private just to spread it around. I mean, honestly, to be fair, he would probably attack this guy. But no, he's going to go here. <laughs> because I can. Oh, he rolled a five. Oh, that is important because they never moved to a building. So he actually does hit. Oh, great. Let's grab a suppressed. That's lovely. And there you go. That's the last enemy activation. And they end with a suppress. Let's take a look at campaign rules. I wasn't playing a campaign. I did a scenario. I raced up the map, uncovered some stuff. But if we were doing a campaign, I'm curious now to see if it's beneficial to stay and fight troops or just get through mission completion. We'll look at that here real quick. Hold on. All right. So just checking. And the way the campaign works is if you have a unit that gets eliminated. So let's say 
you know, this guy was suppressed. Who is that? Private Yu Lang. So let's say Private Yu Lang gets eliminated from the current mission. What happens at the end of the mission, there's a die roll that you make, and it will tell you if that is actually dead or just wounded or maybe lightly wounded and could participate in the next mission. A wounded soldier could not participate in the next mission. He has to recover before you bring him back. So at some point, you can actually kind of build up a roster of folks with different experience levels because experience is you get one experience point for playing the mission. You lose a point. Let's see here what it says. Because this is interesting because it will determine if I want to race through a scenario or not. It says um, experience points. You roll one die six, add the result to your squad's experience points. Keep track of unused experience points on the roster. You lose one experience points if you lost or aborted the mission. So why would you lose or abort a mission? Well, you lose because you didn't meet the objective. I won this mission because I raced through and got there. Uh, some of your other missions might have something where you it's not a race. You actually maybe have to eliminate a target or something. Well, here... In this case, I might play this first mission again. I mean, if you're doing a campaign, you would probably move on to mission two. But what I'm thinking is I might abort because I might, if I had a lot of experience, you know, devoted into this guy here and he's suppressed and possibly could die, I might abort the mission just so I could save him. And that might be a cheap way to you know get yourself experience built up uh, it's hard to say yeah because the the campaign rules it does it just says make possible to play multiple missions as part of a single campaign I mean you know so in a way I guess I could play the same mission over uh, Yeah, I'm just trying to think. Like you could just play this particular mission over and over again, bypass the units, and race through to get to the end so you could say you've completed the mission and gain your experience points. And that would let you build up your people. You know, it's just the grind. You know, in a way, I th when you think about it, I mean, that's kind of kind of a cool thing, right? Uh, a lot of people today, they're playing like Call of Duty and a lot of these games that have role-playing game elements. And some of that means you're you're grinding the gameplay. Well, when you play, there's a chance that someone could die. So you might abort a mission because you want to keep a particular person alive. Then you're not going to get as much experience as if you play it through as a mission supposed to be because you're going to subtract an experience point. That actually just kind of adds a whole other layer of depth to the game that I hadn't really thought about. So for this patrol mission, yeah, easy. Play this over and over. Now a person might say, well, I might as well just give myself all the attributes and all the skills. But, you know, that really depends on how you want to play out the game. I, I think that, uh, I think this is good. I might play a campaign now. I probably won't film it. But now that I've kind of thought about it for a second, because honestly, when I've played before, I've never really thought about just kind of racing through to the end. I kind of thought about that now because I didn't see anything that said you can't move past enemies on a stripe. I'm bypassing them. Hmm. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. I bypassed, sent one group up, left another group back to deal with it. Narratively, I think that all made sense. And if I was playing a campaign, I've now completed a mission. I could get these guys some experience points and build them up. That's a deep game. <laughs> to be quite honest, uh, the more I play this and the more that things come to me as I play, I'm developing future thoughts and strategies for advancement, whether it's a campaign or how to do group development or group creation. Not bad. Well, I think I've probably talk to your ear off a lot about that and if you did watch this all the way through to see comments I appreciate you hanging out and doing that uh, you know if you have any thoughts on the game go ahead share let me know I think that uh, yeah the more I play this I'm seeing more more potential every time I play this is really good 
and I did go ahead, I busted out the miniatures. I'm not the best miniatures kind of person, but I saw somebody do this with another similar game, and it made me think, oh, well, what I could do instead of stripes is make like four by four inch grids. So if I have a tree or woods, I could then do 3D elements, put a little building or something. Uh, but for now, just putting little little soldiers here kind of gives me a little bit of a, a 3D pop to the board. So that that's kind of exciting. Uh, so yeah, I'm definitely enjoying this game. Yeah, let me know what you think. And I'll talk to you later. Thanks a lot. Bye.